Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the Royal Mets and Meteorological Society Student Conference. So today we're, we're virtual uh, as opposed to being in person in Leeds, but hopefully we're going to have some really good science for you today. So this session is the session number one, it's observations. And we're going to start with our first presenter, who is Alex Doyle. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Alex and I am at the University of Reading. I'm in my second year of my PhD um, in the Department of Meteorology there. And today I'm going to be speaking to you on 2016 Indian monsoon cloud development observed using Doppler weather radar. Um, so I've got a bit to speak about, so I'll jump straight in. Cool. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with the monsoon and um, but I just wanted to get everyone on the same page and hopefully um, allude to some importance. Um, so why I care about the monsoon? Well, it's an annual phenomenon. Um, it occurs every year and it's a vital source of water for over a billion people um, in India. Um, of course, India being one of the most populated countries um, on Earth. And it displays substantial variability on multiple timescales. Um, monsoon progression, um, as well as that, is very non-steady. It's not something where um, it moves by the same amount each day. It can jump forward, it can stop, it can stall. Um, so that makes it very difficult to forecast. And why we're going to be looking at cloud development today is because it drives the monsoon forward um, by moistening the mid-level atmospheric environment. And so that's sort of our motivation. Uh, we really um, uh, think cloud development has a lot to do with how the monsoon actually progresses. And as I've sort of alluded to, the represent representation of the monsoon in global climate models uh, remains an area of large potential improvement. There's only really meaningful scale out to three days um, at the moment, whereas here, for example, you, you're more looking at five days or more. Um, and just to sort of hammer this point home, I'm just going to show a quick satellite image um, from each month just to show you the monsoon sort of progressing from the southeast to the northwest and back again. Um, so this is May, it's sort of 12.15 UTC, which is evening time in India. And you see all these white, uh, bright regions are your sort of um, represent your monsoon. Um, for those of you familiar with the intertropical convergence zone, you can see signs of that down here. Um, and so I'll flick through here. As you move to June, you see the monsoon moves into the southeast of the country. Typically, the monsoon start date is around 1st of June each year. And then into July and August, that's sort of around your peak moves right into the northwest of the country and then into September it starts to retreat back to the southeast and so that's sort of what your monsoon looks like. So why are we going to use radars to do this and um, again many of you may not at all have worked with radars at all. Um, this is sort of what they look like this little picture here. Um, they often place them on top of buildings just to stop the any sort of ground clutter getting in the way of, of, um, of the signal. Um, but we care about, we use radars because there's an ever increasing network of radars um, that exist in India and elsewhere in many tropical regions. And they're really useful uh, to be able to look at very high resolution data at one kilometer or even less resolution. So you can look at some very uh, fine scale features in clouds. And they're much cheaper than satellites to build and maintain, and they have longer lifetimes. Of course, uh, they do cover much less area than a satellite, but you can build a lot of radars uh, for the price of one satellite, and you can. Um, look at some very high resolution features. And on top of that, they're used extensively operationally uh, for forecasting. Why not more for cloud research? Um, and so hopefully I'll also show you that radars are really interesting to look at. Uh, so what am I going to show you today? Um, so we're going to use a network of seven radars across India that I'm going to show you some results from to establish large scale patterns of cloud development in 2016. This image on the right is a map of India. Um, with the topography, you can see some major features in the Himalayas. Um, and uh, we see uh, that these seven radars with the blue rings and the red diamonds here are the seven radars I'm going to show you results from today. So the th three points I kind of want to um, hammer home today is that, uh, number one, we can find the depths of clouds across the season using radars. Number two, we can examine the diurnal cycle in cloud depth and compare to rainfall. And we can also compare over land and sea environments. And we're going to relate variability in cloud depths to the large scale monsoon circulation. So those are the three things I'm going to um, give you an overview on today. 
so just a very quick fire method. Um, this is just for the people who might be interested in how you actually do this with the radar. I've put a quick flow chart in here. I'm not going to spend very long on it and I'll breeze through it because I think the results are hopefully more interesting. Um, so don't worry on the specific details, but hopefully I can sort of describe the gist of the process. Um, so the first thing we need to do in order to find the depths of clouds using radars is we need to construct this 3D Cartesian grid. This is because um, if you can imagine a radar, it emits um, signal at a certain elevation angle. And so the further away from the radar, the higher your um, the higher it is. And so you need to be able to look, if you want to look at cloud depth, you need to be able to look at just a specific level. And so we construct this 3D Cartesian grid um, at a certain resolution. And then following that, we can calculate echo top height for each horizontal pixel. This echo top height is essentially the lowest meteorological value in each vertical column. Then following that, we define each pixel as convective or stratiform following um, this fairly basic algorithm by Steiner Tower in 1995. And the reason why we want to split into convective and stratiform segments is that allows us to finally find the cell top height um, by taking all the connected set of convective pixels. So you might have five um, cells in a domain and then you can find the cell top height, which is defined as the maximum echo top height in a cloud region. So that's just a brief overview. I'm not going to spend any longer on that. Um, but of course, if you do have any questions, uh, do type them in the chat. So now to look at some results. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is just some cloud depths. Uh, so these are the average cloud depths. Um, these are the cloud depths over the season as a probability, densi probability density function um, for seven different sites. So we see southeastern India, the black lines, the blue lines are northern India. Uh, the orange lines are northeastern India and the green line is Mumbai and western India. So they've been grouped by region. Um, and we see that you see this very consistent five to seven kilometre um, maximum uh, in uh, the number in, in the depth of clouds that we see. Um, so just a couple of uh, other interesting features to point out as well is that we see a higher average cell top height for northern India. That's this blue line here. Um, this we might expect because it's further inland um, than other sites and so you get more heating into the afternoon, more energy for convection. On top of that, Mumbai typically shows more shallow convection. This is actually because clouds rain out very quickly there. Um, there's a lot of orographic enhancement of cells um, and so lots of collision coalescence of raindrops which allow the clouds to actually rain out very quickly before they're able to grow. Uh, then I'll show you some diurnal cycles. Um, so there's quite a lot to look at in this plot, so bear with me. Um, so we see here that the number of cells, um, this is the number of cells across time, split into 30 minute time bins, and at each CTH, at each cell top height. Um, so we can get an impression of the number of cells at each time of day. Um, and we see that if um, this uh, these histograms here are basically the totals across each axis. And this blue line is the GPM IMERG rainfall, which is a really good comparison, um, which is the, from the GPM satellite. And we can compare um, our rainfall um, in that way. And we've only shown southeastern India here. This is Chennai and Mashila Patnam. And we see a really interesting nighttime peak in convection. So you see um, in the early morning, you see this peak in convection, maybe in the afternoon as well for Mashila Patnam. And there's a slight delay between the maximum number of cells and the peak in rainfall. This we'd expect because um, as cells uh, intensify and deepen, they grow in extent and they merge with other cells and then start to drop meaningful precipitation. And so this would definitely be expected. And also with Chennai and Shilipatnam, uh, we can look over land and sea environments because they're right on the coast and 50% of the domain is over land and 50% of the domain is over sea. So we can look at the same plots, but over land, and over C. And just very quickly, we see that over C, the diurnal cycle has been shifted later. You see more morning cells compared to ever land where they're more in the afternoon. And this is really interesting. We're not quite sure why this might be, but we think it might be something to do with the advection of cells um, from the land regions of a Chennai to the sea regions as um, the evening progresses and that they grow and deepen as they do so. And we see more higher cells over the sea as well. Um, especially for Chennai compared to overland. And then finally, we can also look at large scale variability um, because this is related, you know, we want to actually compare to what's actually going on in the large scale circulation. 
and we've just shown three uh, three variables here. Uh, so this is temperature, this is 95 hectopascal relative humidity, and these are your wind barbs where each sort of barb increment is 10 knots here. And so I'm just going to, again, there's a lot to look at, so I'm just going to sort of circle a few main features. And so the first feature I want to point out is that Mumbai, there's a smaller range in temperature as there's lots of cooling convection throughout the day. Um, so that's why you that's why you get that. And then you also see the temperature peak earlier in northeast India by these orange lines here and that you see consistently high moisture content. And this actually causes northeastern India to have lots of convection throughout the day. And southeastern India, we see this sort of evening sea breeze, the orientation of the coast there. You see winds come up from the southeast, um, which is more of a sea breeze. And this might be something to do with why we see an evening peak in convection there. But we need to look more into this. But this is just to show how we can look at the large scale circulation um, to sort of back up our results. So to summarize, cell top height is a useful indicator of cloud development over the diurnal cycle. And radars are ideal for looking at this, um, for doing this analysis. And the diurnal cycle in cell top height is well correlated with that of rainfall. And we see a nighttime peak of southeastern India and a shift in the diurnal cycle phase between land and sea. And we can look also at these large scale variables, uh, how their reg regimes influence the diurnal cycle and CTH, but they should be viewed alongside each other as there may be competing effects. And I'm hopefully going to be submitting this uh, to general geophysical research in the next month or so. And I'll breeze through some future work as well. Um, We've only really looked at cell depth so far, um, but it would be great also to investigate the vertical structure of these clouds in more detail at each 500 meter level. Um, what vertical structure is associated with different types of clouds and how does this change during the monsoon progression? Uh, we're really interested in how actually the monsoon progression, how, how it fits into that. And then we want to examine different cloud regimes in the Met Office unified model. We want to do more of a modeling impact based study are different cloud regimes associated with different atmospheric regimes? And how does this compare to observations? Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I will answer any questions. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Alex. So yes, if anybody has any questions, you put them in the chat. Oh, there's one already, that's so exciting. Okay, I will just quickly mark that as a question. So the question is, how will the improved understanding of monsoons impact people who live in India? So that's the first part. And the second mm -hmm. part is, is the monsoon changing year on year or can they predict mm -hmm. it anyway? So Yeah, great, great questions. Um, so definitely, as I sort of alluded to early on, I think with India, the forecasting of the monsoon, there's still a lot of improvements to be made. Yeah. Uh, we've only got skill out to three days and um, it would be great to be able to increase that skill. Part of this research is to be able to understand the progression of the monsoon better to, and to understand how clouds are forming and what causes clouds to form. Um, and in understanding that, we'll be able to um, sort of understand the relationship between the monsoon circulation and clouds and precipitation better. And, you know, hopefully, you know, in the long term, that could go into convective parameterization schemes that could go into forecasting um and actually improve the the forecast of the monsoon and that would benefit people in india because um of course they rely heavily on the monsoon they rely heavily on the rains um of the monsoon and a very dry monsoon or very wet monsoon uh, really impacts them and so if we can sort of give them a bit more lead time um in forecasting that will really benefit benefit them um, I've sort of forgotten the second part of the question. You might need to. Remind so the me. second part was: Is yeah. the monsoon changing year on year? Uh, yes, it 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 does. Um, there's sort of multiple parts to that. There's normal interannual variability, where one year it might be weaker than the other. This is just due to natural variability, or might be due to. Um, uh, so you might be familiar with the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, so this can also impact um, if you go from El Nino. Um, to La Nina from one year to the next, this can impact the monsoon. Um, and uh, also on top of that, you do, there are some studies, I don't look at this myself, but some studies to do with climate change, which look at how um, the monsoon uh, is impacted by climate change. And currently um, that's really interesting area to get into actually, because it's kind of inconclusive. We're not too sure 
there's some competing effects going on and we're not too sure quite how climate change is going to impact monsoon but obviously that's very important brilliant thank you very much okay so i think uh that is if you've got time for one quick question i'll do a one quick one so yeah here from viola mm -hmm. uh are you comparing your radar results to any other methods, e.g. satellite, remote sensing, or mm. other form of ground truthing? So very quick. Yeah. yeah. So, the, yeah. So we've looked, um, we've compared briefly to precipitation and GPM IMO precipitation and compared to that, um, but not directly in terms of um, in terms of sales. The best thing to look at would be satellites. Um, we haven't quite got around to that, but it would be good as a sanity check. I agree. Brilliant. OK, well. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, that was a really interesting Thank you. talk. So we'll have, go away to our next presenter, uh, who is Elizabeth Siddle. Everybody. Here you go, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. I am Elizabeth Siddle. I am an oceanographer at the University of East Anglia. And um, today I will be talking about investigating air-sea interaction in the tropical North Atlantic using a novel combination of autonomous vehicles. So first off, what sort of a bit more detail about what I'm looking at is the air, the air sea interactions, air sea fluxes of heat and momentum. Now, why is this important? So quite often in modeling, we look at the atmosphere as a system or the ocean as a system. And actually, we really need to be studying the interaction between the two to get a better understanding of what's going on for the modeling of extreme weather events. But more specifically, what I'm looking at is understanding the heat transfer towards the poles through the SE interaction. So how do we do this? Um, I use two different autonomous vehicles, a surface vehicle called an Autonaut. And this is the large red object that you can see at the top right. And this is a wave powered vehicle in terms of its motion and solar powered in terms of the energy for the scientific instruments. Now, this has been specifically equipped to carry a sea glider beneath it, which is the yellow object in this picture. And that is an underwater autonomous vehicle. So this profile is down to a thousand meters within the ocean and can take a host of different measurements depending on what we equip it with. But specifically what I'm looking at in this case is the temperature and salinity and some current information. Um, for the equipment on the Autonaut, uh, uh, also called Caravella, um, we look from a meteorological perspective at the incoming shortwave and longwave radiation, the air temperature, humidity, and some wind information as well. From an oceanographic perspective, we're interested in the sea temperature, the sea salinity, and some information about the currents. So what did we do with this equipment? Uh, at the start of this year, from January to March, we took part in the Eureka field campaign which was a large international campaign to elucidate the coupling between clouds and circulation. This was based in Barbados. And um, the map on the left here gives you an idea of all the different platforms that were involved in this. So we had four ships, multiple aircraft, multiple different autonomous vehicles spread out around the sea area around Barbados. Where we operated was in the intersection between the RV meteors transect, which is shown by a vertical back black line, and the halo flight circle at the northern end. And this allowed us to have a coupling of different measurements between the different platforms to compare to our surface vehicle. So what we did with the surface vehicle was we deployed from Barbados with it carrying one of our sea gliders below it and sent it out to a study site, which you can see in the top right of this figure here. Our study site was a 10 by 10 kilometer area and when we arrived, we repeated a bow tire shape there or hourglass shape um, across 11 days of the surface vehicle. We also deployed two more sea gliders from the RV Meteor, one of the ships in the area, um, to give us a more comprehensive set of ocean measurements to look at the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. So our uh, surface vehicle um, was able to travel to the site independently using controls by the Iridium network uh, with it being autonomous. And we found this to be really successful. Um, we deployed our sea glider early, as you can see in the cross from the box, to improve the transit time. Um, because this was our first test of this equipment, we discovered quite quickly that it travelled a bit slower than we anticipated it to. 
So initial looks at the information that we were getting from the meteorological sensors on the surface vehicle. Um, like I say, because this is our first mission, this is all about testing whether or not this is a viable system and how well it works. So we did some calibration work whilst we were on Barbados um, of the temperature and humidity readings from our surface vehicle to see how successful it was able to um, produce these readings and how accurate they were. You can see in the bottom two panels here that these um, humidity measurements agree quite nicely with the independent humidity measurements that we gathered. However, in our top two panels, the temperature measurements are a bit more scattered and don't agree so well with our independent measure. Now, we're not initially too concerned about this because part of field work is making do with the equipment you have. And in this instance, we were using a handheld alcohol thermometer whilst on a concrete platform in the middle of the day in the tropics. So chances are this was suffering from um, reflection of heat and um, not giving particularly accurate reading. So in the next stages to have a more accurate, more scientific look at these comparisons was to try and compare the data to the RV Meteor. Now this isn't shown here and this is something that's currently ongoing. But what I have done is given a quick little overview of the temperature and humidity data that was gathered by the surface vehicle throughout the mission. So we can see just from a quick look that these are realistic values and it appears initially that the um, MET sensors have performed quite nicely and we can see some cycling, diurnal cycling of the temperature and changes in humidity, sort of like we'd expect to see a very quick look at this data. Um, interestingly, the data does appear to become a little bit, uh, have a little bit more noise around the 8th of February. And this is around the time that we started repeating our bow tie shape in our study site. So the next step to, for something interesting to look at is whether or not the motion of our surface vehicle on the waves is actually affecting our measurements and whether or not this would be a problem in the future. So at the moment, it's looking really promising for the idea of using this autonaut surface vehicle as a way to measure the variables that we need for calculating SE interaction. Obviously, there needs to be some more testing, more rigorous comparison of the data, but we're hoping that this is going to be a viable method going forwards. So our future work, once we've got all this data together and shown that it is accurate, is to calculate the air sea fluxes of heat and momentum using bulk formula in a sim similar process used uh, in the core algorithm by Farrell et al. And long term, from an oceanographic perspective, we'd like to close the heat budget of the ocean mixed layer, which is the very surface layer of the ocean, um, at the study site using a host of in situ measurements from all the different platforms across the region that were in this area. So I hope that's been interesting for you and giving you a quick overview of how we look at air sea interactions with autonomous vehicles. If anyone wants to know a bit more detail, then you can ask him questions uh, in this chat and feel free to contact me by email or on Twitter after this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat now. Um, it's really interesting. I can't believe there's something called auto not, so I'm very happy about that. <laughs> um, so I see any, anybody got any questions for Elizabeth? Not as yet. So I had one. So you, you say you're measuring the sea surface temperature and the flux between them. Is your aim for this is then using your autonomous vehicles, you can send them out to wherever you want them to be and you can kind of quantify that? Yep. So uh, in as part of Eureka, they were looking at fluxes throughout the atmospheric column and we're sort of adding to that in a very, the small portion of the air sea interaction. But our um, longer term aims as a research group is to be able to send the autonaut with a sea glider down to Antarctica to be able to um, look at the air sea fluxes independently down there, because there's a lot of information that we don't yet know about Antarctica. And that's really important for climate modelling globally in the future. Exactly. As I study the atmosphere in Antarctica, I know that's important. Um, so that's really good. Yeah. So I know a lot of things about the, the Antarctica is like, such a black hole with some models and they're just like what even happens here so that's really interesting so yeah, has anybody else got any more questions for elizabeth um wait for the chat nothing's appearing okay well thank you very much elizabeth and we'll, oh actually there we go we actually have one here so i'll mark that as a question so hannah asks is this the first time autonomous vehicles have been used in a study for observations 
Uh, no, it's not. So there are other types of autonomous surface vehicles. To name a few would be the cell drone and the wave glider. And they have previously done flux investigations in different areas of the world. And um, their is, work is ongoing in publishing. Um, but we specifically look at the autonaut and sea gliders just because that's the equipment we have access to. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much. OK, any, any more questions? No. OK, cool. Right. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. We'll move on to our next presenter, who is Jonathan Coney. Good morning. Um, hello, I'm Jonathan. I'm a master's student at the University of Leeds, and I'll be talking to you about my project, which investigates whether crowdsourcing observations for weather forecasting is useful. Is, excuse me, useful. So. Um, there's a wide variety of home weather stations out there that people can choose to buy, but my project's chosen to focus on those made by a company called Netatmo, because all the stations are theoretically manufactured the same. So if there are any biases in any observations, they should be the same that are manufactured within it, if that makes sense. Um, at this point, I will produce a prop, but um, it's very deep in the university, so these photos will have to do. Uh, the two modules to the left are the indoor pressure sensor, and the um, base station, and to the right, that's the um, outdoor temperature sensor that, it's, that also measures humidity. Um, people used to buy a rain gauge, a tipping bucket rain gauge, and a um, sonic anim anemometer. Roughly half the stations have a rain gauge, and around a third have an anemometer. So you can see from this map that there's far more Netatmo weather stations in the UK. These are all the red dots compared to the Met Office observation sites, which are blue, and there's about 5,000 Net Atmos stations compared to the about 200 Met Office sites. So since we've got all these extra observations, um, can they be of use? And before we can use them in a weather model, we need to be able to trust that the observations being made by these stations are accurate and reliable. So unlike the well-calibrated stations used for observations of temperature by the Met Office, Owners of Netatmo stations are not going to be well trained or well informed on placing the stations properly because they are tend to be members of the public who are buying these stations for their own interest. Um, so in addition, there's issues with the temperature sensor itself. They've been designed to be aesthetically pleasing, which is not something the Met Office tends to take into account for its temperature sensors. Um, and we have conjectured that the aluminium case on the outside of the outdoor station um, has affected the time taken for the sensor to react to temperature changes. So to, um, to work out whether there are biases or anything going on with the stations themselves, um, the first part of the project um, involves testing the TAPMO sensors in a controlled way to see how they react to changes in temperature and pressure. So we've got seven of these TAPMO stations, six of us lent to us by the University of Birmingham, which is very nice of them. Um, as you can see, TAPMO stations do have a lag response. I'll zoom in on this here. Um, it takes, so we, started at 40 degrees uh, Celsius and did a step change of two and a half degrees um, every three hours down to minus 10. And you can see it does take about 40 minutes to an hour for the Natama station to catch up with the chamber. Um, however, if we, if we do just look at the last hour of each test, um, for all seven sensors at each temperature, they did remain within the specified um, accuracy of Natama, uh, which was 0 0.3 degrees out of the way. And then we also looked at pressure. Um, on the whole, they, they do seem to be good at measuring pressure. In comparison to the reference station, the readings tend to be good and they reflect the changes quite well when we ran this over a week. We look at the differences. There are a few couple of anomalies here and there, but on the whole, they are within a hectopascal. So it was nice to see when, uh, just a case of from, from when Kira came over, earlier this year that the UK observations of the UK net atmosphere observations did reflect this quite strong pressure gradient we saw um, from Kira. But what about temperature observations? Um, for April this year, um, the raw data shows net atmosphere stations had a warm bias of 1.56 Kelvin. Um, and you can see the increase in variation during the day, particularly here. Um, compared to the Met observations. Um, there does seem to be a, a dial effect where there is heating 
throughout the day I'm going to attack my where they are e warmer. Um, they were even so during the night they're still a, a warming uh, and bias. So what can we do about these biases? Um, there's been several papers that have outlined methods to remove stations they are displaying errors. Um, here's an example of one method in action. This is from uh, Maya et al. from 2017. Um, and you can see there's all these hotspots that seem to be stations that may be indoors and they've got a, um, they're affected by solar heating or in incoming solar radiation. Um, so you can see visually here quite nicely that um, it does seem to iron out some of the um, anomalies. And if you, especially if you zoom in on the southeast of England, you can see from the raw data on the left, so the quality controlled data using this method, the, the hotspot seems to have been removed. Um, so you can see from the mean invariance plots here for these two methods, the blue being the raw data, the orange, the quality controlled. Um, the warm bias is reduced, it's now 1.32 Kelvin rather than um, 1.56. Um, what's quite interesting, and we still haven't properly worked out why, we've got a few ideas, um, is this decrease in the warm bias each morning, um, especially in the quality control. It's, it's, still, it's still a warm bias, but it's, it's a lot less around 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, we thought it could be down to the lag in the temperature sensor as it takes time for the Netatmo sensor to respond to temperature changes, as we saw in the chamber. Uh, especially because we've got um, a decrease, or, or the, it takes time for the, it to respond to temperature changes, especially in the decrease in the variance as well, which is interesting. Um, so, in summary, um, Netatmo stations and crowdsourcing meteorological data does have potential. Um, if we, this is of interest in the future as observations on a meso scale will be of more importance as resolution of weather models increases and companies offering services such as drone deliveries will want to know on a local scale where and when it's safe to fly. Um, so thanks for your time and uh, thanks especially to um, the organisers for putting this together at, uh, in this new normal as we have. Um, so thanks for your time, I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. And I've realised I've come in quite under time but I have. Don't worry, that's all right. So brilliant, thank you very much. That's a really interesting talk. So we have questions already. So first one from Hannah. We've got, does the chamber, the, no, does the te chamber temperature change instantaneously or do you expect to see the slight lag as temperature is changing? Oh, okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, it doesn't change instantaneously, but it, it's far faster. It takes uh, two minutes or so for it to, at tops to do the two and a half degree temperature change, which in comparison to the 40 or so minutes it takes for the attack mode to catch up, that's that's fairly significant. Um, if that answers that, hopefully, yeah. or oh, you see the slight lag is temperature changing. Um, we, we would expect to see a bit of a lag, but not um, that long, I don't think. Brilliant, okay, well thank you very much. We've got an, another question here um, from Ben, uh, who asks, can you talk about how you get the data from the Netamo stations and how the maps are produced from the individual stations? Okay, Ben, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've got, um, so um, it, I get the data from the um, Netatmo stations using the API um, that Netatmo produce. Um, and the maps are produced by doing an interpolation on the whole UK. So I'm using um, linear barycentric interpolation. So that's the grid data function from SciPy and Python, if anyone is familiar with that, um, to basically just triangulate um, all the temperature observations to produce the um, interpolated map. Very good. OK. That makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Brilliant. So and we've got another question here from Henry. Um, who asks, have you looked at bringing in data from other weather station manufacturing platforms, e.g. Weatherlink by Davis? Okay, thanks, Henry. Um, we have had a look at, um, at other data, and I think that's only what the Met Office do with the WOW site. Um, but there is the question of if we do get other manufacturers' observations in, if there are different issues with accuracies between them, um, whether that will affect the outcome. It'd be interesting to look at, actually. Um, 
to see whether um, that does improve, especially if there's spaces where um, there's other crowdsource observations in places where NetApp I don't cover. So you saw from the map before. Um, let's go back to there. So especially in places like the the lowlands of Scotland, um, where we don't have NetApp observations, it'd be good to see if they could fill in the gaps, maybe. Very nice, yep. Yeah. And I think there's another one here from Amethyst. Do you identify reasons for the warm bias in every case before you remove them from the results so you can verify they are wrong? Um, there's a few sort of criteria within the um, method for the quality control. Um, So it, it, the gist behind it is it removes stations that have inaccurate latitude and longitude, so i.e. ones that um, they have identical latitude and longitude, which suggests they've defaulted to their IP address. Um, and in a comparison with the Met Office stations, if the average daily minimum temperature is significantly higher than the Met Office um, minimum temperature observation, then that would suggest that there's a warm bias and maybe that it's been left indoors. Um, and also where there's a correlation between incoming solar radiation and the temperature difference. So if there's a strong positive correlation between days where we've got um, a lot of solar radiation and where there's a strong difference between Netatmo and Netatmo observation and the Met Office, that suggests that this Netatmo station has been left in direct sunlight. So there's um, heat induced to solar radiation. So it's it's spitting out a, a too warm temperature if that makes sense. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So if there's any more questions? No, I don't think don't jump again. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was a really great talk. And we're on to our final presenters now. So this is a joint talk with Grace and Gertrude. So if I put your slides on. There we go. And it's ready to go when you are. Hello. There you go. Hello. Yeah, my Hi. name is Gertrude. My name is Gertrude, and my colleague here is Grace Afam. We completed KNUST Ghana. We read BSc Meteorology and Climate Science. We are here to present on the topic Uncertainty Assessment of Open Source Graded Precipitation Data Sets, a case study at Bali and Adaf Synoptic Station. We are going to take you through right from the introduction down to conclusion and results. All right, so precipitation plays an important role in maintaining the atmospheric energy balance. However, excessive precipitation results to flooding. Uh, nevertheless, without precipitation, there will be drought, which affects the livelihood of people. In understanding and predicting any meteorological phenomenon, the key products used are precipitation data sets. Okay, but there's a problem. Most researchers resort to the use of open source graded precipitation data sets as a reliable alternative for evaluating models. Yet, these data sets come with some discrepancies. And then, Several works have been done by other people over years. For instance, Kim et al. 2013 analyzed rainfall data from a regional climate model using CRE and satellite data. And at the end of their research, they found a very performance between the two reference data sets. Notwithstanding, there are no research over, there are no research done over Bole and Adalfa which are the main agricultural and seafood production in Ghana. Therefore, there's the need to extend the research to these areas, which are Bole and Agafa. So moving on to the, the main aim of the research is to access these uncertainties associated with this open graded data sets by comparing them with that of 
the Ghana Meteorological Data Center. So to achieve this, we need to determine the uncertainties in the annual cycle, the internal variability, the seasonal pattern and variability, as well as the errors. So we have three um, statistical tools we used in our data analysis, that is standard deviation, the risk misplaced error, the correlation coefficients that measures the variability, the error, and the pattern respectively. Okay, so this is the map of Ada, um, sorry, Bole. Bole is situ situated at the extreme western part of northern region in Ghana, and it has a geographical coordinate of latitude 2.48 degrees and with longitude 9.0 degrees. Adafwa is a town situated at the southeastern part of Ghana with geographical coordinates of 0 0.63 degrees longitude and 5.78 degrees latitude. Here's a, a, a table showing the various data sets used in our research as well as their spatial and their temporal resolution with a study period between 1983 to 2013. Now, let's discuss how our data sets were analyzed. First and foremost, the Adanfwa and the Bolis Synoptic Station data were extracted from that of the GMS data. And then the seven graded data sets were then interpolated into the station coordinates of Ada and Boli. Afterwards, the annual and the monthly totals were calculated and this information was used to draw the interannual variability curve as well as our annual cycle. And with the aid of the monthly totals, we calculated our seasonal sums, which was used in plotting the Taylor diagram we see below. Okay, so this is the diagram showing the season results for winter and spring at Bali. Um, we use the three statistical tools. So these straight lines here are measuring the temporal patterns all the curved lines are measuring the temporal variability. And then the semi, the fainted semicircles are measuring the amount of error associated. The dark curve, the black curve line is what we use to determine that that is the station data, sorry. And then looking at these two seasons, the winter and spring, we saw that most all the data sets underestimated the observed. And then, in terms of temporal variability, we saw that press L had the highest uncertainty with GPCC having the least uncertainty. And then, in terms of the temporal pattern, CMAP had the highest uncertainty with GPCC having the least uncertainty. Moving to the spring season, error in time showed higher uncertainties with CMAP showing the least uncertainty. When it comes to the temporal pattern, GPCC showed the less a lesser uncertainty while error interim showed a higher uncertainty so to the to the summer we are seeing that the temporal variability in terms of the temporal variability sorry CRU showed the higher uncertainty while GPCC showed a least uncertainty in terms of the temporal pattern press L showed a higher uncertainty with GPCC having the least uncertainty. And then moving to the final season, which is the autumn, we can see that, um, okay, we can see in terms of the temporal pattern, CRU has the higher uncertainty with GPCC having the least uncertainty. And then the, in terms of the variability, error in term showed a higher uncertainty with GPCC, GPCP having the least uncertainty. Okay, so this is the annual cycle of the monthly totals at Bole. And then we are seeing that it has a unimodal rainfall peak. The spread of uncertainties increased from the month of March to August. And then the highest peak was recorded, highest peak of rainfall was recorded in September. And then it declined rapidly. And this is the interannual variability for the yearly totals at Bole, we saw that the spread of uncertainties were minimal between the year of 1983 to 1989. And then it was uh, it maximized in the year 2003 to 2010. 
So moving on to the Adda for during the winter season, GPCC had the least uncertainty as compared to error interim in terms of the pattern and in terms of the variability, CRE had the highest uncertainty as compared to PREX-L. And moving on to our spring season, PREX-L had the least uncertainty as compared to CRU in terms of the pattern, in terms of the variability, CMAP had the highest uncertainty against CRU, we had the least uncertainty. So moving on to our summer season, GPCC had the least uncertainty against error interim. We had the highest uncertainty by 85% in terms of the pattern. Then PRESL had the highest uncertainty against CRU in terms of the variability. So moving on to our last season, that's autumn, GPCC had the least uncertainty against error interim in terms of the pattern. And in terms of the variability, CRU had the highest uncertainty against error interim. So this is a diagram showing the this is a diagram showing the dry and the wet years of a steady period over a downfall. So we realized that most of the data sets underestimated the observed at the major rainfall peak with error interim and CRU overestimating it. And then the month that recorded the highest rainfall peak was in June and in October. So moving on to our, to our annual anomaly, this diagram shows the wet and the dry years of our study period over Adafwa. So from 1983 to 1989, we observed a, a minimal spread of uncertainty as compared to the rest of the years. In 1991, there was a higher rainfall recorded and 1992 recorded the lowest rainfall. Okay, so to draw the curtain for Bole, on the seasonal scale, we saw that GPCC had the least uncertainty, while error interim had the higher had the high um, higher values of uncertainty in terms of its temporal pattern. And then in terms of the temporal variability, we saw that GPCC had the least uncertainty. Moving on, with the exception of error interim, most of the data sets were able to mimic the unimodal rainfall pattern at Bole. And then on the annual scale, with the exception of error interim, all the data sets performed best in mimicking the observed data. Finally, it's concluded and recommended that GPCC has shown the best, the, the GPCC is recommended for validation of models output in Bole. So for over the Adafwa area, on the seasonal scale, GPCC showed the least uncertainties in terms of the temporal pattern against error, inter error interim. However, it showed the least uncertainty again in terms of the variability. And on the monthly scale, all the data sets produce the bimodal rainfall pattern of the region, in, of the region with GPCC and error interim having the least and the highest uncertainties respectively. On the annual scale as well, GPCC showed a good magnitude of variability, whilst error interim failed to show the realistic interannual variability of the OZ. To conclude, GPCC sh showed the least level of, of uncertainty. Hence, it should be used for med model validation over ADAFWA. Thank you. So we'll have a look at the questions now. So our first one is from Kez, and it states, have you been able to correlate the rainfall and temporal patterns of climate change? And has there been a change since 1983? Okay, there, there, there has been a change in the rainfall pattern, as we saw from our previous slide. As we saw from our previous slide, that's the annual anomaly. We noticed that for this for Adafwa, there was a change from from this 1983 to 2013. That's the study period we took. We saw that there have been a rainfall change in the pattern. Yes, so the, it, it wasn't a standard. This this is the observed. 
So there had been a change. It's increased at a point and then decreased drastically in 1992 and increased again. So there had been a constant change in the rainfall pattern. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have another question from Ben who asks, uh, thanks for the talk. Could you talk more about the method of gridding? Okay. So that's our data analysis. So first and foremost, um, the Adafwa and the Bolle synoptic data sets was extracted from the GMIS data sets, which was originally given to us in an Excel format. So we graded it with um, using the geographical coordinates of both Adafwa and um, Bolle using the nearest neighbor method of interpolation. So afterwards, we graded the seven da um, graded data sets, that's the open source data set to the um, geographical coordinates of Adafwa. Yes, using the longitudes and the latitude, also using the nearest neighbor net, um, data network. And then we found the annual, that's the yearly sum, and then the monthly sum of both the graded data sets. And then from that, we use it to draw the um, annual scale diagram and then the interannual variability curve. And then with the help of the monthly sum, we grouped um, the seasonal sums that's winter, summer, spring, autumn, and then found the seasonal sums of each. And then this aid us in drawing our Taylor diagram. Brilliant, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. So has anybody else got any of the questions? Oh, we've got one just came then. Um, okay, so Mark's question. So are rainfall totals in Ghana strongly affected by El Nino? Do you know if models perform better or worse during El Nino years? Okay, so um, during, uh, let, let's move on to this slide. So during the El Nino years, this mo models perform better. Okay, some, some of the models perform better than the others during the El Nino years because sometimes it, it might predict a, a higher rainfall, but due to the climatic conditions in Ghana, we, we have an adverse rainfall. We don't really have what the model is predicting. So it, it's not really good, but it's, it's okay. The models are good. Thank you very much. Okay, so okay. any more questions? For Grace and Gertrude? No? Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Um, so that is actually the end of today's session, uh, this morning's session, sorry. And so uh, the next session, I think, is a poster session, uh, it's post session after the refreshments. So there's refreshment and social session with the photography competition at 10.45. And following that at 11.15, there is a poster session and um, there are two, so there's one uh, post session A, and then there's a pre-recorded poster session at the same time. So thank if you, you want to sign up for any of those, please feel free to. So thank you very much for coming along. Okay, thank you. Uh, too. You're very welcome. And yeah, I hope you to see you all at another session. So okay. thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I do. Yes, you're the fellow, yes, yes, the population is.